Let's continue to study understanding bodhicitta. Here is the conclusion of the book. Generating bodhicitta is a huge challenge for one's ego. However, only by applying it can we easily resolve all problems, because bodhicitta is the best weapon to eradicate the attachments to self in person and self in phenomena. We will delve into this book in more detail, and I will select some parts to expound. The Samsaric Mind Let's first continue to discuss the samsaric mind mentioned before. Ordinary beings, based on the samsaric mind, generate various thoughts and actions, thus forming the characteristics of an ordinary being. The degree of the samsaric mind depends on how we nurture it. Those accustomed to greed constantly indulge their greed, and those accustomed to anger constantly indulge their anger. We can easily observe these phenomena in daily life. If we don't reflect on and restrain them, greed and anger will constantly seek targets and take action. Over time, they will become immense. We have many attachments. Now, let's talk about the misconceptions about generating aspirations. Misconceptions about generating aspirations. Among Buddhist practitioners, there are two misconceptions about generating aspirations. First, Some people approach Buddhism with incorrect intentions. Driven by some attachments, they start to learn the Buddha's teachings. This might be the case for most people when they enter the Buddhist path. Some people are moved by the chanting of Buddhist hymns or the recitation of monastics, considering it the best practice. They engage in daily chanting, but in fact they are just attached to the hymns and the sound. Some people enjoy the chanting of Buddhist rituals, considering it melodious. Some people are attached to the advanced philosophy of Buddhism, considering it profound to study. Some people are attached to the magnificent art of Buddhism, believing there are abundant treasures in Buddhist art. Nowadays, this is a prevalent phenomenon in research institutes of universities. They study Buddhism as a philosophy or culture, but have never truly practiced it. People who are new to the Buddhist path often have attachments. That's why the Buddha said, First attract sentient beings with the hook of desire and then guide them into the wisdom of the Buddha. This approach is a skillful means in the beginning. If sentient beings are attached to something, the Buddha will first attract them with what they are attached to and then guide them into the wisdom of the Buddha. This is quite normal. However, It's crucial to guide them into the wisdom of the Buddha later on. If this subsequent step is missing and one only remains in the first step of attracting sentient beings with the hook of desire, then their aspiration is problematic. You should have heard the saying, diligently cultivate discipline, concentration and wisdom and eliminate greed, anger, and ignorance. However, it's strange that although numerous people study Buddhism, very few practice in this way. Some people, as they progress on their Buddhist path, seem to do the opposite. Their discipline, concentration, and wisdom decline, while their greed, anger, and ignorance grow. Regressing to samsaric minds after generating aspirations. Initially, they do have some aspirations, seeking liberation or Buddhahood. However, their aspirations change soon. In fact, 
None of us can guarantee that our initial aspirations to learn Buddhism are pure. Later on, our aspirations should become increasingly pure. The greed, anger and ignorance of ordinary beings are much more powerful than we imagine. The book mentions the attachment to Buddhist activities, which is the attachment to supporting Dharma activities. This is also a stage. In essence, this is no different from the attachment to mundane wealth. Of course, by promoting the Dharma and supporting Dharma centres, one can accumulate merits, which allows them to enter the Buddhist path and study the Dharma in the future. This is the case for almost every Buddhist practitioner. When they first encounter Buddhism and find it good, due to their habit of attachment, they like it and support it. Since they cannot do it themselves, they support the three jewels. They believe that in this way they can accumulate merits and build good connections with Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. At this stage, they are accumulating merits and building karmic connections. Almost every Buddhist practitioner starts this way. No one can skip this stage and directly enter the stage of renunciation from the very beginning. That's impossible. In the beginning, everyone has attachments. However, we cannot always stay at that stage. The role of a good spiritual teacher is to gradually guide you from the stage of clinging to supporting the Dharma onto the path to liberation and further onto the Bodhisattva path. This is the important role of spiritual teachers. Many people, including those who support, propagate and even practice the Dharma, fail to correctly grasp the attitude they should have when engaging in dharma activities. This is because they don't have a right understanding and view. As a result, after generating aspirations, somehow they regress to samsaric minds. This is a prevalent phenomenon in the Buddhist circle. Although they have outwardly achieved great Buddhist missions that look remarkable, Inwardly, they have also nurtured typical samsaric minds. So, you should know that the famous people in the Buddhist circle don't necessarily have high spiritual attainments. They are often Dharma supporters. Those who have truly attained enlightenment may not be famous at all. There might be low-profile practitioners who practice in monasteries throughout their lives and have attained liberation. It's possible that these truly enlightened practitioners are not famous, while those who support them are famous. Of course, if one has attained Buddhisattvahood through practice, that's a different story. If one has truly become a great Buddhisattva, their Dharma missions may be great. At that time, their bodhicitta is already stable, as well as their right knowledge and views. They are truly practicing the Bodhisattva path, which is different from the path to liberation. There are very few practitioners who can attain liberation, widely propagate the Dharma, and practice the authentic Bodhisattva path. This is very difficult. I hope you can take your time to cultivate bodhicitta. It's essential to generate a firm bodhicitta. The scale of the Dharma mission is not that important. Even if you can only enlighten one sentient being, it's okay. However, your aspiration should be qualified and you should earnestly practice the path to liberation and the Bodhisattva path. This principle is similar to practicing patience. You cannot cover the entire earth with leather, but wearing a pair of shoes is enough. Similarly, the key is your state of mind. 
Even if you can only enlighten one sentient being, it's okay. You can continue your mission in the next life, so why do you rush? If you properly enlighten one sentient being, it's enough because they might widely propagate the Dharma. For example, the fifth patriarch enlightened the sixth patriarch, and the sixth patriarch made significant contributions to Buddhism. Of course, the fifth patriarch also enlightened many other disciples, but the sixth patriarch was his main disciple. If you enlighten someone well, then enlightening one sentient being is enough. So, don't seek to enlighten many sentient beings. However, we must strive to purify the samsaric mind through diligent practice. The samsaric mind can disturb us any time, anywhere. Therefore, we should strive not to become individuals who have achieved great Buddhist missions outwardly, but nurtured typical samsaric minds inwardly. You should be mindful. Don't end up like that. After one's mission reaches a certain scale, one may even cling to one's own system and community. This is a prevalent phenomenon. Some people, after graduating from a Buddhist academy and acquiring some knowledge, build a temple and become its owner. They are very narrow-minded, clinging to their own views and refusing to open their minds. They cannot open their minds because they don't learn from others. They think, I am a spiritual teacher, so it's enough to learn my teachings and read my textbooks. They don't connect with other teachers. They have their own set of textbooks and practices. This is not appropriate. In fact, this kind of sectionalism and sectarianism is a manifestation of ego, as the ego can grow with one's mission. Do you understand this statement? The ego can grow with one's mission. So, if your ego grows, it indicates that there are problems with your practice. In a spiritual community, if the leader's ego grows with their mission, the students will eventually run into problems. If the leader is not mindful of this, many problems will arise later, and the students will have huge egos. In the end, what they do is completely opposite to spiritual practice. On the surface, they may appear to have a great mission and significant influence in propagating the Dharma. However, their ego and attachment also grow day by day. It's crucial to understand this principle. Over 95% of people may not have noticed it, so they run into problems one after another. This is what I realized recently when contemplating Buddhacitta. Although this principle is simple, it is crucial, especially for students, because you still have time to grasp it. If we generate a strong bodhicitta and continuously adjust our thoughts and actions, we won't be swayed while working for the benefit of sentient beings. This is very important. If we continuously adjust our thoughts and actions, we won't be swayed while working for the benefit of sentient beings. Some people may say that since working for the benefit of sentient beings can bring about so many problems, it is better to mind one's own business and not get involved. However, in that way, you cannot benefit all sentient beings or achieve Buddhahood. We should know that the practice of bodhicitta is very proactive. If we don't work for the benefit of sentient beings, we cannot fulfill bodhicitta or attain the qualities of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Therefore, we should accumulate the merits to attain Buddhahood by benefiting others. 
The key is to work with the right intention and always maintain the intention. This statement is crucial. The key to work with the right intention and always maintain the intention. This is the core. We study every day in order to achieve this. First, we should have a right intention. Second, we should always maintain the right intention. This is the most important thing for us to do. Of course, the right intention includes the right understanding and views. Only in this way can we benefit sentient beings and meanwhile attain the qualities of Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. Please bear this in mind. Achieving a glorious mission and significant influence doesn't mean that you can attain Buddhahood. This is different from worldly activities. The key is to work with the right intention rather than achieving a glorious mission. Even if you were to unify the entire world and make everyone live a happy life and believe in Buddhism, it doesn't mean that your mission is great. This is because if your intention is wrong, you might become a great demon. A great demon can make people all over the world live a happy life and believe in Buddhism. However, his intention is not Buddha Therefore, the key is not the scale of the mission, but having the right intention, as well as maintaining the right intention. This is very hard. Only in this way can we attain the qualities of the Buddha. We should feel fortunate to know the misconceptions about generating aspirations when we are new to Buddhism. However, merely knowing it is far from enough. If we don't earnestly grasp the essence and put it into practice, even though we know it, it is futile. Even though you know it, you haven't truly comprehended it and put it into practice. This is because the samsaric mind is too powerful. The samsaric mind is too powerful. As a result, even though we know the right aspiration, we often forget and lose it. Therefore, we should earnestly train and adjust our thoughts and actions with these sublime methods from the Buddha's teachings. Otherwise, even if we understand the principles, it is futile. Many of us understand the principles, but what we do is often wrong. This is because we are not clear about the principles. The ego is cunning and always seeking excuses to protect itself. There are countless channels in our inner world. Sometimes, when we tune into a channel, another channel with a stronger signal takes over. When watching TV, we also encounter similar situations. The ego has a strong signal and can take action at any time. Deep in our minds, each mental factor is like a channel of the mind. Some are weaker, some are stronger. The strongest mental factor dominates us. The strongest mental factor dominates us. The most dangerous mental factor is the attachment to self because it has been formed since beginningless time. So, during spiritual practice, The biggest enemy is self-attachment. Once self-attachment is completely eradicated, other afflictions will be easily resolved. Although other afflictions may still arise, once self-attachment is subdued, it will be easy to subdue other afflictions. If you can tame even the strongest enemy, then with a little effort, you can tame other minor enemies. During spiritual practice, it's crucial to avoid regressing to samsaric minds after generating aspirations. This is also the key to generating aspirations. 
upon careful analysis, we can see that our inner world is very complicated. Although we study non-self every day, our inner world is complicated. Even when we engage in virtuous actions, it is hard to guarantee that we have a pure intention to benefit others. Of course, there should be altruistic intentions, but meanwhile, our ego is also present. Moreover, it is hard to be free from attachments and concerns about gains and losses. Although you are benefiting others, your ego can be deeply ingrained. When giving alms, your ego may arise and you may think, I am giving alms to you or I am helping you. This is the mentality of a big brother giving something to his retinue. For example, they may give a stake of money to their retinue and say, take it, I've got you covered. Although they are helping others, they have strong attachments, concerns about gains and losses, and a strong ego. The more they give, the greater their ego becomes. We tend to judge who we should benefit and who we should not benefit, with many limits. Hence, we can see that even when we engage in virtuous actions, we are still driven by the samsaric mind. Such people are practicing the ten virtuous actions in the human and heavenly vehicle. Since their minds are samsaric, what they practice is called the human and heavenly vehicle. If we are not mindful, the samsaric mind will gradually take over and eventually replace our initial intention to benefit others. As a result, what we achieve can only be the samsaric mind. Only if we generate a pure intention to benefit others can we attain the compassionate qualities of Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. It's hard to generate a pure intention. That's why we need to eliminate self-attachment. If you don't eliminate self-attachment, you won't have a pure intention to benefit others and a qualified bodhicitta. In this case, we can only call it similar bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is selfless. It's impossible to be completely selfless from the beginning. However, after generating a similar bodhicitta, we should strive to become more and more selfless. Thus, our bodhicitta will become purer and purer. That's why it's called similar. Since it is similar, the degree of similarity varies. Is it 30% similar, 50% similar, or 80% similar? They are different. If it is 100% similar, it will be easy. The Diamond Sutra and the Aspiration Prayer of Samantabhadra tells us that a genuine bodhicitta should have characteristics such as awakening, altruism, boundlessness and freedom from the attachment to attainments. We should use them as the standard and constantly examine and adjust our thoughts and actions. These are the characteristics of bodhicitta, which we will discuss later. To correctly generate bodhicitta and grasp the essence of Buddhist practice, we should first recognize the misconceptions about generating bodhicitta. There are various systems in Buddhism, such as Mahayana, Yogacara, Huayan, Lotus, Nirvana, the Middle Way, and Prajna. However, if we find the core and essence of spiritual practice, we will realize that all Mahayana sutras and treatises are guiding us, though from different perspectives. All Mahayana scriptures help us elevate the purity of our bodhicitta from different perspectives. Bodhicitta encompasses the wisdom of emptiness as well as great aspirations. It is the union of compassion and wisdom. In other words, 
What a cheetah encompasses both wisdom and compassion, great aspirations. If we find the core and essence of spiritual practice, we will realize that all Mahayana sutras and treatises are guiding us, though from different perspectives. The Yogacara teachings, such as the analysis of the mind and the descriptions on how the mind operates, can greatly help us understand how to generate aspirations. The ultimate goal of the Buddha's teachings is the same, though the paths may vary. Although the methods of practice and realization are different, they are essentially interconnected. Today, we discussed the misconceptions about generating aspirations in more detail. You should pay attention to them.